So a little different from our previous speakers, I'm not talking about a specific course, I'm talking about a collection of my experiences. Um, so I've taught um, blended grad course uh, challenges of educational leadership. I've taught uh, two different adult ed courses that are fully online related to leadership as well. And then I've taught um, in teacher education and I've used a flipped approach for that. So I'm gonna sort of bring those all together and connect to this theme about flipping the instructional focus. Oops. Your buttons. <laughs> there we go. So for most of us, um, this is how we teach. This was our experience when we were in university. This was our parents' experience. This was probably our grandparents' experience, and on and on and on. Very traditional, it hasn't changed uh, very much at all. Um, and unfortunately, <laughs> this is very often the response. We do have a few people that are engaged and paying attention, but we also have people that are napping, daydreaming, and, and things like that. So kind of, maybe this traditional approach is not the most engaging. So then people thought, well, you know what? These kids today, they're digital natives. Let's take that lecture and put it online so now the students can take it anywhere with them. They can do it at home in their pajamas. They can do it on a tablet while they're waiting for the bus. We can now take the lecture and move it anywhere. <laughs> and unfortunately, this has been the response still. There still are people that are highly engaged, and as Dr. Lightstone said, um, you know, those strong students, they have no problem. Strong students will do well in any type of format, but a lot of um, the middle students and the weaker students struggle. So instead of just flipping the medium or flipping the notion of where the lecture is, I think we need to revamp and uh, flip the entire focus. So this is our typical uh, way that students spend their time. Spend a few hours reading the textbook, hopefully the textbook, um, or the journal articles or whatever the readings are. Uh, and then again, they spend a couple hours in the lecture. And again, please note, these two are quite passive. And then maybe they spend an hour in the seminar discussion, which is the more active learning um, experience. The problem with that becomes apparent when we line that up with Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom's taxonomy, we look at the higher order thinking skills. And that's where learning really takes place when they're doing something with that information. They're analyzing, applying, evaluating, creating. Unfortunately, when we look at this traditional approach, they spend most of the time in those lower order thinking skills, just remembering or understanding. <laughs> so I think the key is, if we really want to emphasize students first, as Dr. Lathrop began in her uh, introduction, we need to think about students first, and we need to flip that approach. We need to really focus on learning, and let teaching fade into the background. It's a slightly different approach. But when we do that, it brings us back to Bloom's taxonomy, brings us back to where this learning takes place in the applying, analyzing, evaluating, creating. And it starts looking a little bit more, or could look a little bit more like this. So instead of just remembering, we want students to analyze as well. And we can present them with a video. It can be a video that we created or a video that we found online. And one thing I think that is, is key with those videos, as we've heard some of the other speakers saying that, very often they don't have to be very professional, it doesn't have to be high quality. I started off and I did a green screen video where I put myself in the slides and it just took forever to make and in the long term wasn't uh, really worth it. But I have started learning that each week I do a video that's online uh, that I put to the students that does a quick review of what we did the previous week. I connect and personally do shout outs to some of the students and their comments they made to the discussion boards and help link that to the coming week. As well, I like to put a video to start off the week or the session because it's a good way to ease them into the topic. If we start off with something that is too cognitively challenging, students kind of click off and they go on to something else. So if you start with a video to engage them and draw them in. And as well, we see a lot of the literature now is talking about 
When we give someone content, we have to give them something to do with it. And that's why I like to give a poll. Just a poll gives them an opportunity to analyze something of what they've seen in that video. As well, the literature that we've uh, coming out of the MOOCs, uh, one of the great things about a MOOC is that when you have 20,000 people in a class, you can think about it as a laboratory experiment. And what they have been doing is looking at different ways of delivering that content and then measuring the different impact on student learning. And so one of the things that I have seen is just as some of our colleagues have talked about already today is condense those videos down. Uh, they've talked about the ideal amount of time is six minutes, but 10 minutes or less to present that content and then have them do something with it. Um, just know, I put all the links to some of this literature up on my blog that I think Julie's put a link to on the CPI webpage. So give them a video less than 10 minutes, give them something to do with that video, uh, that content. Then next, instead of just understanding, we're not gonna throw away our textbook, but we're gonna give them an opportunity to apply what they've learned from that textbook. And you can give them a mastery quiz. It could be a mastery quiz or just could be a low stake uh, quiz as well, and I think there's some great literature related to that, the benefits of that, because those quizzes help them to focus their attention on what were the key things in the textbook or the reading or the journal article they had, but again, it gives them an opportunity to apply that, and it's that process of applying it, process that new knowledge for them, and helps to cement that learning into their memory. So. The key thing is then when you're giving a quiz that it's not high stakes because then they get all freaked out and they're more nervous about how it's going to impact their final mark. But a mastery quiz, we can use Sakai very easily to do that, gives me an opportunity to keep taking the quiz until I get the answers that I want, until I get the marks that I want. As well within Sakai, if you have a large class, um, you can create a quiz bank. So maybe I want to give a quiz and I have 10 questions, but I don't want everyone to have the same quiz because they're just gonna sit beside each other and tell each other what the answers are. So I can create a bank of 10 quiz questions and have it randomly select three to five for each student. Again, the quiz is not about, I wanna know, um, I wanna see how little you do or don't, don't know. I wanna use that as formative assessment, so assessment for learning. So that's why we can use the quiz after we've used, uh, looked at our textbook uh, or our article reading. The next thing is we want to make certain students spend a lot of time applying, analyzing, evaluating, or creating. So notice there's no lecture. And again, a lot of literature that's coming out right now that says that the lecture is not the best format to support learning. So instead of the lecture, we look at ways to engage the students in discussions, debate, and create. And again, whether we're on face-to-face -face or online, we have a variety of tools that we can use for that. So when you're online, Sakai has a great forum tool that you can use. And for myself, I tell the students up front, I do not want them to engage in what I call coffee talk or cocktail party chatter. So when I put a discussion question there, the discussion question is there for them to demonstrate their knowledge. And the way I do that is that I grade each of those discussion posts. And grading is built into Sakai tool for to do that. And I give them a one, two, or three. A one says that you attempted to answer the question. That's about it. A two says you answered the question. And a three means you cited the information from the course content in your answer. It's also a great way for us in education when we use APA citations to see if they understand how to use those citations. Because generally about by the second or third week, they know how to use a citation and know how to cite what they've learned from the course content, so that could be the video, their journal article, the textbook, in their answer. It makes it significantly easier when it comes to marking their papers and ensuring that they're using proper citation. The other thing that's a great feature on the Sakai discussion grading tool is that if you post something and it's coffee talk, I can send a message to you in grading and saying, hey, I'm giving you a one and here's why. Generally, again, by the first two weeks, coffee talk is gone. Everyone understands that the discussion forum is an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge related to the course content. They can, in sub subsequent posts, go and give their opinion, connect it to their workplace or things like that. But their first post, post always has to be related to the course content. 
And that's why you can use the discussion tool to have debates, and again, they need to be informed debates, not coffee talk. They need to highlight the course content to support their opinions related to the debates. And as well, it's a great opportunity to create as well. So you can use the wiki tool or uh, some of the other tools for them to then also go and create. Uh, create specific learning artifacts relating to that. So I think that's a little bit of what the flip focus looks like. So and I also think it's very flexible and it can be used across a number of different mediums. So as I was just talking about, here's what it may look like for an online course with our online video. And, and one thing that I've definitely learned from my experience, when you do an online video, embed the video. And the people at C C uh, CPI can help you with that. For whatever reason, one starting off a course, I just put the link to the video, and the video was my introduction and welcome to the course, and there was a forum discussion about it, if you have any other questions. And there were all these questions, and I'm like, wait a second, all those questions are answered in the video. And I went back, and this is again the, the great thing about using these online tools, I went back and looked at how many views the video had gotten, and no one had watched the video. Well, then I was a little bitter and petty. <laughs> so I embedded the video, and I know this is not good practice. I embedded a self-starting video. So as soon as you opened up Sakai and got there, boom, there I was in your face. <laughs> and you could not miss me at all. Uh, but I learned, again, embed the video. It's hard for them to ignore. It gets them into it right away, and it draws them into whatever the task is that's going to happen. So that's what it looks like when you're doing an online course. Here we have a face-to-face -face course. So still gonna have my online video, I'm gonna embed that. Still have a couple simple polls, uh, mastery quiz related to the textbook, and then when they come to the face-to-face -face class, instead of a lecture, we're gonna engage in discussions, debates, or I'm gonna give them opportunity to create something. So this becomes a highly engaging opportunity, and it also gives them access to the most valuable resource in the course, which is us to guide them and guide their learning during this time. It also gives us opportunity to interact with them on, in a small group, face-to-face -face, um, opportunity, which really highlights the main benefits of face-to-face -face teaching. If it's a blended course, so 50% of the course is online, here we have our uh, online video, our textbook, and even some of our discussion and debate can take place online. So when they do come to class, all of that time is creating and taking advantage of all the resources, meaning us, that are there and their peers and colleagues to create something. Again, if you want to get back to how Dr. Lathrop started this all, she talked about putting students first. And if we really want to put students first, regardless of the content, regardless if it's a classics course, or a physiology course, or a communication course, regardless of the tools that we're using, if we're using Sakai, or Blackboard, or blogs, or Twitter, regardless if it's an online, face-to-face, -face, or blended course, the key thing is to focus on learning ahead of teaching, and that way we know we're supporting our students' success. Thank you.